But the fact that aquariums can, through almost no effort at all, invoke a meditation experience for the viewer is profound and important. And the war, I think we would all agree the world needs more of that. Hi, that's Alex. And he's Ryan, and we're the aquascaping type. And that was Jeff Sinski. This was one of those conversations that does not require retrospect to know that you're lucky to be having it. I know, we talked for like two hours and I could have sat there for two more. If you're watching this, I'm sure you're acquainted in some way or another with Aquarium Design Group, or ADG, a company started by Jeff and his brother Mike. And you're probably also pretty familiar with their amazing gallery. Side note, we recently did a cinematic tour of the ADG gallery and we'll put a link at the end of this video. In our conversations with Jeff is really clear that his considerable skill and talent is matched only by his passion for elevating this hobby. And that really comes through in this conversation, especially the immense influence Takashi Amano had on him as an aquascaper and as a person. I think it's time we let Jeff speak for himself. I was interested, I grew up around aquariums, so it's an interesting story for me because you know my dad kept aquariums, uh, he, ha he owned a tropical fish store uh, even before I was born, so I was only born into a tropical fish store. And as a kid, I just thought everybody had, you know, 10 or 20 aquariums in their house. I thought this was just a normal part. I'd, you know, this is, everybody has this, right? You breathe air, you eat food, and you have 20 aquariums. In those terms, it wasn't really necessarily a, a passion, per se, or something that, uh, it was just a natural extension of, of, of living, actually. And so, um, so before, before aquascaping, I was keeping aquariums, and I was even working in aquarium stores and uh, somehow trying to make it look cool. I was fortunate to have an older brother uh, who very early on was had a real knack for making it look cool. Now I say it making it look cool because it wasn't really aquascaping, it wasn't intentional, it wasn't philosophical, it wasn't trying to say something about nature or um, it was just the ability to look at whatever material he was going to use and this applied to a, uh, a saltwater tank equally. Um, but the ability to look at the material and just somehow arrange it in there in a way that looked cooler than most other aquariums that I saw. And so we wouldn't have known to call it aquascaping then, but uh, I was probably fortunate to have someone who had such a natural inclination for that uh, very, very early on that, you know, we don't always see eye to eye and we um, uh, definitely have different ideas at times. Unfortunately for ADG, we've always been on the same page in terms of how we want to present the brand and present our, our work. So Mike is definitely better at making this a business, that, that's for sure. And he's also incredibly talented aquascaper, aquarium designer. Mike really is the, the, the full package for uh, making a business out of designing aquariums. Um, I'm probably one to push the boundaries of the, the design side of things uh, or doing something just for art's sake that may not be the savviest business move of all time. That structure's served us well in that he's allowed me a lot more creative freedom to experiment and the experimentation has led to cool things that we were able to make a product out of, a product that we can offer as a scalable style. That's where the freedom, the creative freedom that I've been allowed has helped inform a product that is something I think people can have a very high degree of confidence it's going to work. Even building a kind of a gallery centric retail aquarium store environment is, you know, took some risk and some experimentation. It wasn't following the traditional aquarium store model. Well, that dynamic between Mike and myself is, you know, what allowed me to make such a space. 
because the whole time I'm going, well, if you come, if people come in and their first act is uh, being inspired and sort of creating an emotional connection to an aquarium, then that's going to do a lot more to encourage them than a long-winded discussion about pH or cycling or something like that or how much water changes they're going to need to do. It's an important part of the interplay between uh, Mike and myself and strengths and weaknesses allowed me a creative freedom that if I was exclusively running the business side of it to the extent Mike does, probably wouldn't happen. The, the first time I've discovered Mr. Mono's work, I was already uh, working, uh, designing aquariums on some kind of level. Uh, I was working for a company uh, doing aquarium maintenance. Uh, it's literally uh, in the in the office of that company, uh, the owner had all three Nature Aquarium World books, almost there just for decoration. And I pull it down and I open it up and it just didn't even, it looked like something that wasn't even possible to do. You know, I thought, well, surely there's some kind of trick here or some way that it's been manipulated or so. Um, it was just, it was something so profound that, you know, I immediately started looking for ways to incorporate something about what made that so effective and so and, and yet kind of going well all I'm really seeing right now are like aquariums and buildings and it was the idea that you could bring in these compositional principles that Mr. Manos was showing us that intention and also somehow pick up on other design cues of the space and bring that into the aquarium like that was something just really really interesting to me it was sort of a perfect storm of timing in terms of being in a position to see where aquariums in buildings was kind of missing the mark or missing the broader potential and seeing again what mr mono had done which wasn't about showing us the aquarium necessarily integrating in the space but it was showing us intention and philosophy and like something more purposeful than a than a fish tank i think those two elements coming together definitely shaped a trajectory for Aquarium Design Group. But ultimately, Mr. Mono's influence was probably the, the prevailing uh, element in the equation. And obviously what he was doing with a, with a freshwater aquatic plant-based approach uh, covered so much ground. I mean, if you look from a minimalist Iwagumi style up to the most densely planted red stems and so many species wildly different but yet equally effective in expressing something different and i always use that word intention though to me that's the real that's the pivotal pivotal uh, element if there's a specific adg style uh, when i hear of the style my, my takeaway is always my hope anyway is that what people are seeing and interpreting as a style is more the net effect of something that was composed with a certain kind of purpose to it um, somehow. And that kind of way may be copying one of Mr. Romano's works. Uh, anytime we put a stone in an aquarium pointed at a certain kind of angle to invoke, to invoke tension, we're we're hopelessly referencing Mr. Romano's influence, and um, so in that sense, I couldn't really. How could I claim that that's my style? You know. So yeah, it's a little bit of a tricky uh, thing to ponder because you're trying to bring in that kind of intentional feeling in every kind of aquarium that you do. So, so it's challenging for me to see actual characteristics I could take away in kind of a bullet point sort of a way to what would define a particular style of ours or an ADG style. Um, it's just trying to do every type of aquarium well. In terms of keeping Mr. Mono's legacy alive, it, it's actually kind of a big deal for me because I think for the first time we might have a generation of aquascapers and they may not fully know who Mr. Mono was all the way. Uh, they probably have a notion, I'm sure they've seen ADA. They may have even come to it since Mr. Mono's passing in 2015 and so their notion of ADA is this slightly different presentation we have now. You know that history and that influence and that 
it's something that is just very important to me personally because if there was no no Mr. Romano, no ADG. I, I can assure you that, that. Or what we would have done would have been probably a little bit better version of aquariums and buildings. Everything cool that we know in aquarium presently is practically all of it is informed in some way by Mr. Romano's influence. And so uh, that's something that is still fresh enough in my memory to not ever want to let go of or forget or and I I would never take credit for any aspect of things that I are directly derivative of um, his very profound and revolutionary uh, influence. I can draw inspiration and sort of fuel for uh, creativity from some probably unlikely places sometimes and environments that we might as aquarium hobbyists sometimes not view as like the the coolest place in other words I don't journey into the woods all that often I've never scuba dived in my life um, for me it can really come from any sort of experience and that may be the experience of driving past a weed choked ditch on the way home and just seeing somehow you know there's a little world there and I will say it I might see a little world in the ditch on the side of the road that I might not have noticed its charms prior to again seeing the way Mr. Romano clearly saw those charms and found a way to reflect them in an aquarium in that same ditch would be considered a nuisance weed he's somehow made it extraordinary and then sometimes too getting inspired by the way things are done at say the museum level or the uh, uh, high-end retailer level or this kind of way we'll, I'll also try to bring those elements in and that ends up being reflected in certain aquascapes or layouts also uh, I find that a lot in the hardscape only style because of its sort of usually inherent minimalism and uh, ability to say something with the fewest possible words. Um, Chris Laukup, I don't know how many more of his freshwater, underwater uh, videos I can handle. I mean, it's just inspiration overload because he just seems to find these locations. I'm like straight beautiful amazing underwater uh, environments and so I try to glean from all those different categories of, uh, of just human expression. If there's one aspect or dimension of aquarium that I'm always trying to reorient myself toward it's this thing where uh, just by looking into an aquarium with even just relatively clean water and fish swimming around okay so we're not even including an aquascape or a, a, a coherent underwater scene if we just have relatively what what we would perceive as as a healthy environment and fishes swimming around that we can measure and you know using science and we love our science right so we can use science to show connecting the diodes to the body and putting the the person in front of the aquarium and watching what happens. And the fact that somehow the heart rate coming down, uh, even brain wave activity switching to these more meditative states, when they do the added step of analyzing uh, a sample of blood during this aquarium viewing experiment, <laughs> We see uh, reduced inflammation markers, uh, we, we, which is inherently linked to heightened immunity. Um, wow, just taking in an aquarium scene, the wisdom running the body is taking place. And this wisdom that's running the body is not you, it is not, it's not the me talking in the head, incessantly talking in the head, but that's not what's running the body. In other words, the voice in my head, in this thing that, in, the, in my case, this Jeff character, is not the one who is looking at the aquarium and 
uh, telling the heart, well, we're looking at an aquarium, it's time for you to uh, slow down. It's not telling the blood pressure, oh, it's time to lower, we're looking at an aquarium. This me in the head's not doing any of that. There's a certain wisdom running the body that's also digesting your food and growing your hair. You know, you don't, it's breathing you. You're being breathed by this unfathomable force that we can use our measuring devices to go, wow, taking in the aquarium scene, uh, there's a connection link to that unfathomable force running the body. More of that, please. Uh, that's meditation. Because in that few moments that I'm taking in the aquarium scene, the reason all those things are going down is pretty well understood at this point. Uh, even if it's just a few seconds, and then in the neuroscience will tell you, yep, we did a test, and even a few seconds is effective. So even for just a few seconds, you aren't thinking. Lo and behold, a, a human being, in the absence of the chatter in the head for even just a few seconds, is enough to get the body to go, oh, God, thank you. Whew. What, an, what a miracle it is to be alive. Anyway, back to thinking now. Could there be anything more profound about the possibility of an aquarium in a human life or its contribution to humanity than the fact that it ha and it's not the only thing on the planet, clearly, but that it has that capacity. Um, if I can seek ongoing ways to lead with that in however I present an aquarium, never-ending mission of inspiring an effortless meditation um, filter media or the new light or a pump that moves five gallons per hour more than the version one model did or whatever and all that's necessary and cool and I'm I'm there for all of it I'm just saying the philosophy the philosophical takeaway for me is the is can we please put our efforts towards more humans gaining access to an effortless meditation by just looking at aquariums. <laughs>